All right, so today I'm going to talk to you about nasal high flow in neonatology, and I was given the title, Go With The High Flow. Now, if you ask some of my colleagues and friends in the United Kingdom, in fact, this is the poster that one of those friends has on his office door, which says, keep calm and go with the high flow. So let's see what we all think at the end of this talk. I'm going to try and cover what is nasal high flow, the advantages or potential advantages of high flow over CPAP, the mechanisms of action of high flow, and then concentrate on the existing evidence for high flow use from clinical trials, of which there are now several. Then some complications and controversies, high flow in clinical practice, how do I think we should use it, and future research. So what is nasal high flow? Well, nasal high flow is the use of small binasal prongs delivering heated and humidified blended oxygen or air, similar to with invasive ventilation or with CPAP. And typically we're talking about gas flows in clinical use and those in clinical trials of between two and eight litres per minute, which you will all recognise is quite a lot higher than what we've traditionally used in neonatology just for oxygen delivery. And at the moment, manufacturers and clinical trials are saying don't go above eight litres per minute with nasal high flow, but we'll see what we think at the end of the talk. And most of us are using one or other of these two commercially available devices. In my part of the world, Fisher & Paykel is a New Zealand company, one of the largest companies in New Zealand, and so we're very much used to using their heaters and humidifiers, so it's simple for us to switch over to high flow from CPAP. But in other parts of the world and in Australia and New Zealand now, vapor therm precision flow is becoming more popular. So what are the potential advantages of high flow over CPAP? Well, there's now uh, several surveys from varying parts of the world asking clinicians and parents just that. And to summarise the results of these surveys, they say that they think high flow is easier to set up and use than CPAP. It provides better access to the infant and may improve bonding with mum. Parents and nurses have repeatedly been shown to prefer it over CPAP if they have the choice. There's this thought that it may improve uh, uh, suck feeds in preterm babies and that it's more comfortable and causes less nasal trauma. Now, not all of those statements are evidence-based. There is, however, some evidence from uh, published studies that high flow is more comfortable for infants, although that is notoriously difficult to measure, and these are unblinded studies, as are virtually all the studies I'm going to discuss today. It's very hard to blind the clinician to whether a baby's on high flow or CPAP. Where there is a lot of evidence for an advantage over CPAP is with nasal trauma in preterm infants. If this was still a question in your mind, you, don't need, you no longer need to ask that question. High flow causes a lot less nasal trauma in preterm infants than traditional CPAP interfaces. So those potential advantages, and depending on who you listen to, some people have completely converted to high flow use, have caused a dramatic rise in its use. And this is da data, these are data from my part of the world, Australia and New Zealand again. That's my colleague Callum Roberts in the top, top left corner. This is Australia and New Zealand neonatal network data showing the increasing exposure of preterm infants to high flow over recent years. And if we, oops, sorry, if we update that to the most recent report, three quarters of extremely preterm infants are receiving high flow at some point during their inpatient stay and half of very preterm infants. And along with that increasing use has come an ex exponential rise in the amount of data and publications on nasal high flow use in, in infants. Uh, and this is showing the last 20, uh, 30 years or so, but three quarters of all published data and citations have occurred in the last four or five years. And that's led some of us to ask this question, is nasal high flow going viral in neonatology? I now just want to touch on the mechanisms of action of high flow without spending too much time on this. There are several published uh, papers that you can look up if you're interested to read more about the science and physiology behind high flow. This is Dr. Satyan's figure that appeared in, uh, in a review article in Maternal Health, Neonatology and Perinatology, talking about the different uh, mechanisms of action of high flow. And I'm just going to touch on two of them, that is wash out of nasopharyngeal dead space, dead space and the generation of distending airway pressure. So this concept, concept of nasopharyngeal washout is an important one when we're talking about high inspiratory flows of gas. This is an in vitro study from Philadelphia uh, looking at the washout of CO2 from, from, a, from a, an, a benchtop airway showing that with the mouth closed and minimal leak that high flow actually washes out CO2 
uh, better than does CPAP. And with the mouth open or with a higher leak, they're quite equivalent, although at higher flows up around eight litres per minute, again, high flow very effective at washing out CO2. There's also now many published studies on, on pressure generation in the airways with nasal high flow compared to CPAP. So there is pressure generated in the airways, if that's your question. And what all of these studies are showing here is you don't need to be able to see the X and Y axes to see that they're all sort of trending upwards. As the flow increases, the pressure in the, uh, measured uh, in the airways, and these are uh, usually esophageal or upper airway pressure measure measurements, rare that they're lower airway. But as the flow goes up, the pressure goes up. Also, if you put the same flow into a smaller baby, the pressure generation will be higher than in a bigger baby. These studies here showing the smaller the baby, the higher the pressure generated at the same flow rate. Also, as we know from CPAP, um, and as stands to reason, this study by Sivieri, again from Philadelphia in a, in a benchtop model, shows that as the prong to nair ratio increases, i.e. the leak decreases, the pressure generated goes up. And I think this slide is very important because whereas with CPAP, our most, still our most common uh, form of non-invasive respiratory support, you're setting a maximum pressure to be delivered to the infant, although that may not be what is delivered to the infant. You're setting a pressure with high flow, you're not, you're just turning up the flow meter to whatever number you pick. And therefore the pressure is variable between infants and is not set. These studies here are showing that at the same flow rate, for example, four liters per kilo per minute, very variable pressures generated in different infants, and similarly here. It's also important to look at what sort of pressures are generated, and to summarise all of the, these previous studies, I would say that in general the pressure generated is somewhat less but similar to what we uh, set with our CPAP pressures. What I've done here is simply in green um, show, showing you the, the standard sort of CPAP pressures we're using between five and eight centimetres of water. You may go slightly lower or higher in your centres. And you can see that there are a lot of pressures that are lower than that, particularly when you're under four litres per kilo per minute in this slide here, or under four litres per minute here, and also some that are higher and that may be worrying, and I'll get to that later on. So to summarise all of those slides, higher gas flow, smaller baby, and a lower leak leads to higher pressure generation in the lungs. And the leak is very important with nasal high flow to avoid very high pressure generation, to encourage nasopharyngeal washout, and of course for infant comfort and to reduce nasal trauma. Okay, now I'd like to move on to the existing evidence from clinical trials, and I've divided this section up into primary or early support, that's first line support out of the delivery room, and post extubation support, and also in the early support category I'm going to look at both tertiary and non-tertiary centres. And for those of you that would like to do more reading about this, this is the Cochrane review of the topic, uh, this is the updated review published in 2016, although even though it was only published two and a half years ago, it's already out of date. There are three or four or maybe more randomised trials published in the last two years or currently under about to be published and so we're currently updating this now. This is my hospital, the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia, and high flow is close to our heart because we've now conducted three of the largest RCTs of nasal high flow in preterm infants. We started with the, they the, all start with H for a reason that's beyond all of us. Um, the hyperspace trial, which was a post extubation trial in preterm infants that compared high flow and CPAP, 300 babies. The HIPSTER trial that was a primary support trial, so first line support in the intensive care unit for very preterm uh, for preterm infants 28 weeks and above, 560 babies. And the recently completed HUNTER trial, for those of you working in non-tertiary hospitals with special care nurseries, this will be of interest, 750 babies, high flow versus CPAP. So that's over 1,600 babies that we've contributed to the literature. So let's start with primary or early support in tertiary centres, in NICUs. And when we're interpreting high flow primary support trials, it's very difficult because everybody does it a little bit differently. They enrol different infants, they use different gas flows, pressures and devices. No studies have included extremely preterm infants and that's an important takeaway point. I think if you're using high flow uh, to treat your extremely preterm infants straight out of the delivery, delivery room, that's not supported by evidence, although there are plenty of people that say it works. 
Um, these studies also have different treatment failure criteria and they differ in their use of rescue CPAP or nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation in the high flow group and with the use of rescue surfactant. So it all gets very complicated when thinking about uh, how to group these studies together. But as best I can, I've tried to look at treatment failure, which some of the studies go straight from high flow to treatment failure and report that, others allow surfactant, and then I've looked at intubation, and several of the studies have a bailout or rescue CPAP uh, in, the, in the high flow arm that means that that muddies those outcomes a little bit. So this is a forest plot summarising the data for nasal high flow versus CPAP as primary support in NICUs. You don't need to be able to read all of this. Down the left hand side are the included studies and on the right I've tried to group these into gestational age subgroups. So we've got very preterm infants at the top, more mature infants here, other studies that don't break them up into different groups and an overall effect. And you can see we've got 1500 odd babies included in primary NICU studies. Anything to the left of this vertical line, high flow is better. Anything to the right, CPAP is better. Here's our, the largest study of high flow uh, as, pre to, as, as primary support in NICUs. That's our HIPSTER trial. And you can see where the uh, effect sits there. So overall in very preterm infants, the diamond is a fair way to the right favoring CPAP. So the risk of treatment failure is 13% lower if you use CPAP instead of high flow. In more mature infants, the effect is less, but still CPAP comes out on top, about a 7% reduction in treatment failure, and an overall effect of about a 9% reduction in treatment failure if you use CPAP as first line compared to high flow. Now you might say treatment failure is neither here nor there. That just means that you reach some pre-specified treatment failure criteria and you're right. If we look at intubation, remembering in the HIPSTER trial and in several others, we allowed rescue CPAP, there is no difference in the rate of intubation in preterm infants between high flow and CPAP. So to summarise that, when talking about nasal high flow as primary respiratory support in the NICU, CPAP is superior to high flow at preventing treatment failure. There is no data in extremely preterm infants. However, in preterm infants born 28 weeks or above, there's no difference in the intubation rate if you've got high flow and CPAP in your unit. And it's clear that rescue CPAP with or without surfactant, of course, reduces differences in the outcomes between treatments. We've tried to take this a little bit further and look at some of the predictors of whether babies will be successfully treated with high flow as first line. And surprise, surprise, the two things that come out in the wash from our 560 baby hipster trial were lower gestational age and higher uh, supplemental oxygen requirement before randomization predicted high flow treatment failure. Okay, what about non-tertiary centres? Um, could I get a show of hands? How many of you work in non-tertiary centres? That is non-academic, non-tertiary centres without a NICU? Okay, so, so maybe only about 10% of you. Um, well, I'm pleased to say there is now some evidence around high flow use in these centres. Certainly in Australia and New Zealand, this was becoming popular with no evidence whatsoever. So we conducted the HUNTER trial. So in this trial, we enrolled babies that would normally be in a non-tertiary special care nursery in Australia. Those were, they were born 31 weeks gestation or above with a birth weight of 1200 grams or above and were less than 24 hours old. And they were randomised to either high flow six litres per minute up to eight or bubble CPAP six centimetres of water up to eight. And in fact, so even the control arm in some of these centres was a little bit different to their standard practice because now we were asking them to turn the CPAP pressure up to eight and these are non-tertiary centres. And the primary outcome was treatment failure within 72 hours. Again, we allowed, we allowed crossover between, not crossover, we allowed babies in whom high flow failed to receive CPAP. So this was a multi-centre non-inferiority trial and I think Barbara and Haresh haven't seen them yet but I think they're going to talk about non-inferiority trials on Wednesday morning in nine non-tertiary hospitals and we needed 750 infants and included 754. And this was the primary outcome of the trial, treatment failure within 72 hours and you can see that the treatment failure rate was 20% in the high flow group and only 10% in the CPAP group, highly significant difference again favouring CPAP by 10%. However, there was no difference in mechanical ventilation, no difference in transfer to a NICU, no difference in surfactant, death or pneumothorax. If anything, the pneumothorax rate favoured the high flow group. There was a small difference in hours of respiratory support or oxygen favouring CPAP, but no difference, sorry, no difference in duration of hospitalisation.
So that's the only study of high flow versus CPAP in non-tertiary centres, and the conclusion from that is that CPAP is superior to high flow at preventing treatment failure, although high flow with CPAP backup, again, uh, is safe and there's no difference in the rates of mechanical ventilation or transfer. And if you've only got high flow or you only want to use high flow, that might come down to individual decision making around the baby in front of you and around your centre's capabilities. Because even though I've painted this as CPAPs better than high flow, still 80% of preterm of babies were successfully treated with high flow. Okay, what about post extubation support in NICUs? So again, we've got some of the problems with interpreting these studies that, again, different flows, pressures, devices were used. There's a small number of extremely preterm infants, and I'll emphasise that again later. And again, there was some use of rescue CPAP or NIPPV in the high flow group, so that studies could be summarised as looking something like this. Most of them reported treatment failure. Some of them allowed then CPAP or NIPPV before intubation. So again, here's the forest plot summarising the data. We've got about 700 babies here. This was our initial post-extubation study shown here and one of the only studies in extremely, that included extremely preterm infants. So for less than 28 weekers, there is no difference. The diamond just touches the line, although it is heading towards favouring CPAP. And in more mature infants, no difference whatsoever in treatment failure rates and overall no difference. When we look at intubation, there's about 850 uh, babies included here. Now the diamond is uh, right over the line there and no longer favouring CPAP, and that's because rescue CPAP was allowed in the high flow groups. In the more mature infants, if anything, the diamond's gone further to the left and overall no difference in intubation rates. So from post-extubation support, we could say nasal high flow has similar efficacy or is non-inferior, if you like, to CPAP and can be used as post-extubation support in preterm infants. But we need to be cautious in extremely preterm infants when there, where there is minimal data. Although, again, with CPAP backup, there was no difference in extubation failure. So the use of nasal high flow in neonatology has not been without controversy. And every now and then a paper like this pops up associating nasal high flow use in neonatology with higher BPD, death, ROP and postnatal steroid use. And it's really important for us to think carefully when we interpret the data and look at these sorts of papers because is it the chicken or the egg? And we need to be very careful when we interpret retrospective studies looking at associations and go back to the RCTs and the meta-analysis for the answers. Where there is some concern is around the duration of support and whether you use it as primary support or as post-extubation support, people are worried that it's increasing the duration of respiratory support, particularly in the more preterm babies. This slide summarises the data from RCTs. Those studies that reported a mean duration of support are shown here and overall it is slightly longer in, in high flow, but we're talking about 0.4 of a day, so not a huge difference. In our two trials here, we did see one day longer in the hipster trial of respiratory support that may or may not be important, and five hours longer in non-tertiary centres that may or may not be important. With post-extubation studies, however the duration of support has been reported, there is no difference between high flow and CPAP. Having said that, why might high flow use, especially if we use more and more of it, increase the duration of respiratory support? Well, it might be because it's less effective and babies need more support. It might be because we're not good at weaning it, and I'll be interested to hear how you're all weaning or increasing your flow rates. I know some of you are doing it by 0.5 litres per minute or 0.1 litres per minute and weaning all the way down to one litre per minute, for example. Is it the definition of respiratory support? Is high flow two litres per minute in air, is that respiratory support? Is high flow four litres per minute in air respiratory support? I'm not sure. Or are we intentionally using it for longer in more, in more babies because they look comfortable, the parents like it, and we leave it on. It's heated and humidified gases. But whatever way we're doing it, we need to be diligent in weaning and ceasing high flow, especially if we're classifying it as respiratory support. I talked earlier about pressures, and these are some old studies that have raised alarms about nasal high flow use, reporting babies that had pneumothoraces, high pressures, scalp emphysema, pneumocephalus, all sorts of horrible things. And so I do hear this a bit, that if you turn the high flow up too high, like some centres won't go above six litres per minute, you're going to get pneumothoraces or air leaks. Um, I can reassure you about that. Here's all of the RCTs reporting pneumothorax. These are the primary support trials. So these are babies, many of whom have not had surfactant, most of whom have not had surfactant. 
absolutely no difference in pneumothorax. And if you're worried about post-extubation studies, don't, because if anything, there are less pneumothoraces with high flow use compared to CPAP. I think one of the biggest controversies that still remains unanswered is which device we should be using. I mentioned we have used the Fisher and Paykel system in Australia and New Zealand a lot uh, because that's what we've had and that's what we used mainly in our RCTs. But when you speak to those people who use Vapotherm routinely in clinical practice, and in fact some centres have completely replaced CPAP with high flow, they're usually using the Vapotherm system and they swear there's something different. On the other hand, how can it be different? I don't know. Um, air is blowing out a hole coming out of a machine. It's heated and humidified at a gas flow and going into the baby. Nevertheless, I think this is an important question that we need to look at. Okay, so what do we do? How do we use high flow in clinical practice in Melbourne? Well, we use it as an alternative to CPAP and in NICU, it's our routine post-extubation support for preterm babies born 28 weeks or above. So we're avoiding it in extremely preterm infants where there is minimal data and we're worried about uh, the fact that high flow may not be as effective. We're using it in stable infants on CPAP when they're stable enough to switch to what we think is a more comfortable and easy to use support. We're using it in babies who have established or are threatening to have nasal trauma and we're using it if we've stopped respiratory support and babies need to go back on something as an alternative to CPAP. We're not using it as primary support in infants born before 30 weeks, mainly because of our secondary analysis of the HIPSTER trial suggesting that those lower gestational age were, ages were at much higher risk. So we're currently undertaking a prospective audit looking at babies born 30 weeks or above in less than 30% oxygen, so that's quite a well population to see if it may be effective in that group. And we're using it in patients with evolving bronchopulmonary dysplasia as an alternative to low flow. And this is an evidence-free zone. We're doing this because we wonder whether we might in fact limit exposure of oxygen to those babies. Instead of giving them 100% oxygen low flow nasal cannula, we may be able to have them in air more often if we use higher flows. And so that's a, something that's crept into practice but is not evidence-based. We're using the OptiFlow Junior F&P system. We're starting our gas flow for all indications at six to seven litres per minute, which may be higher than what some of you are doing. We're always turning it up to eight litres per minute or trying to, and if it's not working, we switch babies to CPAP. And we use increments and decrements of at least one litre per minute when we're going down or up on the flow, and we try and do that once or twice a day, although that doesn't always happen. And our standard minimum is four litres per minute, not maximum, minimum is four litres per minute. And at four litres per minute, if babies are stable in minimal oxygen, we stop the high flow. And in babies that have recovered more rapidly than that, even if they started on six or seven litres per minute, had some TTN and got better, we just stop the high flow. We don't wean it, just like you might stop the CPAP cold turkey. We have tried to come up with some consensus guidelines uh, to this, and some of us got together a few years ago, and these were the things we came up with that we uh, acknowledge the need for adequate heating and humidification, which all the commercially available systems do. We think it's important to have a leak at the NAIRS, only to go up to eight litres per minute, other than in clinical trials, to assess the fraction of inspired oxygen and work of breathing to determine the need for gas flow changes, to always wean the oxygen first before weaning the gas flow, and that we all thought we could use high flow as post-extubation support in preterm babies other than extremely preterm infants. So in conclusion, nasal high flow is a useful therapy that's still finding its way in neonatology. It's not superior to CPAP in any clinical role in any of the randomised trials, but it's comfortable, easy to use, reduces nasal trauma and may, may or may not reduce pneumothorax. So the evidence suggests high flow can be safely and effectively used as primary or early support if CPAP is a backup is available or as post-extubation support in infants born 28 weeks gestation or above. And where's this leading us in the future? Well, we've got lots of ideas and things that are underway. Firstly, in the non-tertiary setting and the lower resource setting, I think there's a lot more for us to do. Cost effectiveness analysis, looking at predictors of which babies could be treated with high flow versus CPAP and asking parents and nurses what they think. And we've got all of those things underway. We wonder whether higher flow rates above eight litres per minute might be more effective. We wonder about using high flow in the delivery room as an easy intervention with or without minimally or less invasive surfactant. And we'd like to perform some sort of head-to-head -head comparison of high flow devices. One of the things we're looking at at the moment, this is Kate Hodgson, my PhD student, is the use of nasal high flow to increase the successful 
uh, in increase successful endotracheal intubation of, of preterm and term infants uh, and keep them stable during that procedure. So the idea here is that a baby undergoing elective intubation or even delivery room intubation, put the nasal high flow on the baby at eight litres per minute, intubate the baby, and when the baby's intubated, take the high flow off. And this is a study that we've just started now. Here's a real late preterm infant being intubated by a first year resident. High flow prongs are in in about three seconds. Endotracheal tube goes in, we're monitoring the oxygen and the heart rate. And the idea here is something similar to the Thrive technique in older infants and children which anaesthetists are using um, for uh, apneic oxygenation during anaesthetics. And high flow has been shown that it keeps oxygen stable even when infants and children are apneic for several minutes or longer. So that's a study underway at the moment and we'll keep you updated on that. So should we keep calm and go with the high flow or not? I'll maybe leave the answer to one of the great philosophers of our time who said, don't ever go with the flow, <laughs> be the flow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.